All right, uh, today we're going to welcome uh, our guest who's representing, uh, I guess, the true culture side of New Orleans. Mark Samuels started Basin Street Records in September 1977 as a hobby while working in the energy industry. That was, that was 97. 1997. 97. It, while working in the energy industry, artists on the label include Los Hombres Calientes, John Cleary, Kermit Ruffins, Rebirth Brass Band, Henry Butler, Jason Marcellus, Dr. Michael White, some guy named Irvin Mayfield, Teresa Anderson, and the Headhunters. They have received the Grammy nomination, Billboard Latin Music Awards, Downbeat Critic Poll Awards, numerous Big Easy Entertainment Awards, a multitude of Offbeat Best of the Beat Awards, and many other accolades. The website is www.basinstreetrecords.com, and that site was named to Macromedia's site of the day. Basin Street Records was named the best label six times and the music business of the year two times at the Offbeat Best of the Beat Awards. Mark has been named to New Orleans City Business's Power Generation, to Gambit Weekly's 40 Under 40, and to Offbeat Magazine's 20 Most Influential People in Louisiana Music Industry. He was also Kingfish Magazine's Kingfish of the Month. Mark has received a BBA and an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin and early in his career worked for the New Orleans World's Fair for Anderson Consulting, now Accenture, and for Sulphur Tree Company, which is the uh, company that purified natural gas around the world. Mark was also an adjunct professor at another local institution, whose name we won't say, Music Industry Studies Program, Loyola University. In his spare time, he takes care of his wife and four children, and he serves on the boards of the Louis Satchmo Armstrong Summer Jazz Camp and Louisiana Appleseed. He also served for several years as a mentor for the Loyola University Business School freshman. So let's welcome our guest, my good friend, Mark Samuels. Thank you. Um, so the business that you did before the energy business, just to clarify, what exactly did you do? In, a business. in the energy business. Right. Uh, in the energy business, Sulfur Tree Company, we purified natural gas. We had a dry granular material that was an iron oxide. You put it in a big pressure vessel, maybe 20, 30 feet high. It looks like uh, kind of like kitty litter. And fill up the vessel with the kitty litter looking material. It reacts with the hydrogen sulfide, the Fe203, Fe304 combination, proprietary kind of combination of material reacts with hydrogen sulfide forms FES2, which is iron pyrite, fool's gold, water, and, uh, and we take it to a non-hazardous landfill and dispose of it. And it was a, that, that business, I basically drove, went around the world and sold product to Venezuela and Mexico and uh, the Middle East, uh, as well as most of it in the United States. Um, and it was something that only became theoretically feasible because natural gas prices started going up back about that same time. So that's, that's what I did. I was technical services manager. I had no background necessarily other than the typical kind of background in chemistry and science, um, but uh, just kind of learned it. Uh, family business? Family business. Uh, two families. And, and I'll, I'll mention this because it's, a, it's really something that I try to make sure that I get across to everybody. Whenever you enter any business, any family business, any partnership, your best friend, your brother, your sister, whoever, figure out a way that you're going to get out of it, or how you're going to fairly get out of it when you're tired of each other, when one of you gets married, when one of you wins the lottery, and have all of that situated before you get too successful preferably before you really get rolling in your business. It's a very, it was a two-family operation. Two families didn't get along, and we spent more time, more of our productive time suing each other than we did in selling product. How did you get into the record business? I mean, those two businesses are very separate, right? You're they are very separate. Two different worlds, right? Uh, very separate. Um, I was looking for something, knowing that I was in these, let us, uh, while going through all the litigation with the other family, I knew that there was going to be an end of this, that business, for me at least. And the business actually continues to exist. But I always knew there'd be an end. And for about three or four years, I explored options so that when I got out of it, I would have something to do. And I went to high school with Wynton Marsalis. And I had a lot of interest in the, in the music business. And I made a lot of contacts through my friendship with Wynton. And I used to produce some um, concerts just for fun uh, for the Cutting Edge Music Business Conference that my brother was a, 
manager for. So in doing the conference manage, in, in producing these couple of showcases with some of the New Orleans great acts like Kermit Ruffins and Michael Ray and uh, Wes Anderson, a great sax player, the, I, I ran into Kermit Ruffins' manager, Tom Thompson. Tom and I started talking about the possibility of me uh, becoming a, I wanted to be maybe a booking agent or a manager, and we talked about sharing resources and coming and joining forces and using this, uh, helping each other out. And I would pick up my management clients and he'd have his. And uh, next thing you know, rather than doing that, he and I started the record label together to, in order to put out Kermit Ruffin's first live recording called The Barbecue Swingers Live from Tipitina's. And it was supposed to be just a night and weekend hobby. And after a short amount of time at doing that, um, like releasing the record and about a month later running into Irvin and picking up Los Hombres Calientes as a result of a chance meeting with Irvin, the success led to changing it from a hobby to a full-time business. The music business um, in New Orleans, we, we always talk about New Orleans, the Holy Trinity, archi architecture, music, and food. Being from the energy industry, so you've had what people would consider to be a legitimate profession. Um, how do you explain to people? We've had Soledad O'Brien was our guest here, James Carville, Mary Madeline. We had Carl Connor from B British Petroleum. Uh, you know, we had John Hankins who runs the African American Museum of Art. You know, some very serious people. What does music belong in that? H how do we tell people music is serious or it's important to someone who's doing um, oil and gas work or maybe they're, you know, political consultants or they run a law firm or they're an accountant, they live here in New Orleans. Why is the music business uh, vital and important to them, is it? Well, I think that regardless of the industry that you are in, everybody, most people, appreciate music, appreciate the way it lifts you up, the way it, it uh, makes you feel uh, for your spirit. Um, so from a, and, uh, and food serves the same purpose. So regardless of what you're in, but if you want to start talking about where music fits in from an economic point of view, you start giving people uh, illustrations like, I was just reading yesterday that Cara uh, Giordano, I believe is how you pronounce her last name, one of those judges on American Idol. She's a songwriter. She's written songs that have sold 150 million copies of CD on, you know, for, various so for various artists. And she's written songs for that have sold 150 million CDs. She's probably by herself generated just from the manufacturing and, and the mechanical royalties of, of the CDs sold $15 million on top of all the licensing fees and everything else. And that's just one songwriter. So it becomes kind of easy to start illustrating the economic benefit of, of, and the commercialization and commodity as the, com, uh, some people refer to it as a commoditization of culture. Monetization. Uh, monetization. Uh, but com turning, turning the culture into commodity. So, um, so that's, you know, the energy business is a true economic driver in this state. There's no question about its importance to the state. It's in no, and no question about its importance to the, to the United States economy. But um, it doesn't necessarily, other than being able to jump in your car and put the windows down, it doesn't necessarily make you feel good like music does. Let's talk about you last signing, because you just signed someone to the label recently, and let's talk about the very next CD you have coming out, which comes out next month. Uh, right. This Tuesday, actually. This Tuesday. This Tuesday. Um, the, this Tuesday, we have a new CD by Kermit Ruffins. It'll be our, I believe, our ninth full-length CD with Kermit, um, called Happy Talk. The CD release party's on November the 5th at, the, at Rock and Bowl, and He's going to have a lot of, we have a publicist who's uncovered a lot of good opportunities. He's going to be on Jimmy Fallon's show on, in December and um, sitting in with the roots. So we're excited about it. We think it's going to be a, a really great record. Um, Kermit's profile since the last record we did, he's had a season of Treme under his belt on HBO. 
Um, he was seen on The Real World on MTV quite a bit this past year. So I think that we're going to see some uh, solid results of that. And we're also real excited because we signed the Rebirth Brass Band. And the Rebirth Brass Band has been touring the world for 27 years, very well known in lots of, lots of markets, and haven't put out a new record uh, in about seven or eight years. So we'll start recording that one next month and release that in February of 2011. And it'll be a fun one. Why should they buy your product? Well, I joked with Irvin before this that, you know, he, he joked about promoting his competition, but <laughs> there is only, you know, there's each artist, each is, is their own person, unless you're listening to something on Clear Channel, and then it's pretty much homogenous and it doesn't really matter who they are. But that's each, a big, that, that's a big statement. Well, <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> but there is, if you're a fan of Irvin Mayfield, if you're a fan of Kermit Ruffins, you're a fan of the Rebirth Brass Band, and you have a, uh, then you should, then you should buy their music, and you should support the things that they do, and if they make you feel good, and you enjoy going to see the Rebirth on a Tuesday night at the Maple Leaf, then you should support what they do, and, and that, that's the reason you should buy their music, but you should buy music that makes you feel good, and you should buy music. Um, if you don't buy it, if you if you get, come upon it in any, in any illegal method, then I, <laughs> I am one of those people who believe the prosecution to the fullest extent of the law. So how many of you guys buy music versus uh, receiving it in other ways? How many buy? How many come across it in other? Right. Two people that really. Well. <laughs> video. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I believe that, that that's the only way, and I'll say this, I don't think that people go out there necessarily and try to rip off Kermit Ruffins. His fans, I don't think they're the kind of people that would go out and just rip him off. There are people that maybe think that Britney Spears makes so much money and her record label makes so much money that it's okay to burn a CD for a friend because she's already made all the money she can make. But the, the downside even to our company from doing that is that there is no longer a Virgin Megastore and there's no longer Tower Records and there's no longer Warehouse Music and there's no longer all these outlets for you to buy our music because people stop buying their music. Um, so I, I suggest that you buy all buy or legitimately find the things that are given away for free. I mean, today you could find, if you did a search, you could find a song from our upcoming CD by Kermit with a simple search of Kermit Ruffin's Happy Talk. You would find a song out there that we want you to take for free. Um, Why would you say in New Orleans we have such a long history of great music? Um, much as we've had, a, we've had a long history of culinary artists, why do you think that we haven't seen the same level of growth in the industry of music that we've seen in the culinary field um, or that we've seen in other, other places? Uh, for instance, like in Italy, you know, you have the three tenors um, who are mega, mega superstars uh, or just the Italian uh, tradition of the aria and folks singing opera in Italy. It's something they own, the Italian opera. Uh, in New Orleans, we have so many, we have so many things that we've brought uh, to the United States of America and to the world that we started, incubated in New Orleans. Um, traditions that lend from opera all the way to creating jazz here. Why do you think we haven't seen the same level of growth that other places have really enjoyed or other industries have really enjoyed? Well, on the subject of like other music, you know, comparing say the opera in Italy to jazz and, and, and New Orleans music, I can't speak to that well because I don't know necessarily that either people buy a lot of that music in those countries, in those cities that it's popular. I don't know, I don't know what those numbers necessarily are. And I, I, and I don't know that how many people necessarily go to see them. I, I just, personally, I don't, don't know those statistics. 
in the 13 years that I've been in this business, though, I do feel that there has been growth tempered by our hurdles. Um, the first of those hurdles being like 9-11 and then obviously uh, Katrina. But I believe that the, the, not, the recognition of New Orleans music through some of the things, a lot because of those hurdles that we've had to overcome, I think that, the, that New Orleans music is something that's in the, more in the forefront across the country and across, and across the, the world. Uh, there aren't, I've said this too, but that there are, there's room for a dozen labels like mine in New Orleans. There's so much talent. But it, is a, it, is this, it requires a large capital investment to, um, that not a lot of people are in a position to make. And certainly from a standpoint of a label like ours, which to be quite honest with you is driven by me, my taste in music, and my wallet. So it's rare that you're going to find somebody who's putting their money, their efforts behind the artists that they most love. And that's something that you're not going to be able to find a lot of. The major labels, they may certainly have somebody who's into a certain artist and pushing a certain artist. Um, but it's financially driven for the most part. They're, it's somebody that's been brought to them. An A&R person has brought that artist to the label and somebody is assigned to work that project. It's very different than being everything. Now, that gets back to the reason that it nece hasn't necessarily taken off is that there is room. There's so much talent in this city and there's room for a dozen labels like ours. It's just a question of getting people who are interested in music, who can help, who can put together the packages, uh, the financial packages, to be driven to create. Um, I don't know if I answered your question necessarily or not, but well, I, why I aren't there more? Why, why, why aren't there five? <laughs> okay, why aren't there three serious labels in New Orleans comparable to Basin Street Records? I mean, everybody knows New Orleans is music, music, music. I mean, I'm quite certain if you tell anybody you're from New Orleans, people want to know where you can go hear good music. People, you know, it would be like uh, not having any serious restaurants or having one really good restaurant in New Orleans, one really good business for the culinary arts in New Orleans. What's the, what's the difference? I don't, well, I think that it's, it goes back to, in the culinary arts, a lot of the time I believe that you've got a chef who's driven and a chef opens a restaurant and they're driven and they're driven to work 18 to 20 hours a day and be creative and run a, run, run a restaurant. You don't necessarily have a businessman who wants to own a restaurant who says, I'm going to own a re I really want to own a restaurant and I'm going to hire a great chef. I don't know that it's driven that way. So you've got... And well, let's take some examples. What about the Brennans? Well, I don't know the, the original history of the Brennans, whether they were Brennans that were restaurateurs or whether one of them or two of them were chefs first and driven that way. But obviously the Brennans is, an, is a fine example of, of restaurateurism at the highest level business acumen at the highest level, being able to grow a company, becoming an uh, international name. Um, and we have a few of those examples in this city. And, but we also have a few examples that are driven by Emeril and Chef Besh and, and, and chefs who, who are the ones who are the driving force, the, the they may very well be able to put the package to the, you have to have, invest, I mean, most of those guys have investors behind them at a certain point. They're, they're, they've got to bring in some outside money. I mean, Emerald now is in business with uh, Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart. Uh, but, he didn't, but he didn't need Martha Stewart to get to the point that he got to. He's, he's, he's at a high level and he wants to expand even more. But, um, but I think it's the drive and the, and the wherewithal 
You saying musicians don't have the drive? I don't think the no musicians have the drive, but they don't necessarily have the skill set to also run labels and do all the business side of things. Being a musician and being a being a musician, being a pr practicing. You know, there's very few. I mean, Irvin's one of those examples of somebody who's w way beyond being a musician um, and has always recognized, I'll say this, I'm going to give you my plug now, is that he's always recognized that he has to surround himself with talented people um, and whether it be a manager or an agent or, a, or uh, assistants. Um, but he's an exception to the musician in New Orleans. Uh, the, it's, it's much more typical to be like a Kermit Ruffins who, who has a manager, but if you ask him if he wants to get a booking agent too, it's like, well, no, then I'd have to pay a booking agent. And, you know, so that's more typical. My question would be, do you think that is because of is it a skill set in the musicians, or is it a void of infrastructure placed around? You know, is, well, it, is it a void of investment in, in music? I just don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it's the, you know, it's the old argument, but being a musician, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it's the musician who isn't really doing their, doing their part. I know. I didn't say the musician. I'm saying the musician is not necessarily creating a label and hiring publicists and doing all the things that. Whether you know, a record label does functions that any one artist could do. I mean, if you if you're, so it's. I just don't think that necessarily that an, every artist is out there doing all the things that they need to do to be a label, their own label or or. F um, but, the, in. The industry now is such that when I started, 13 years isn't very long, but in 13 years we've gone from, I guess there was 2,000 good independent record stores and now there's maybe 800. There were, um, there was Tower, there was Virgin, there was Warehouse Music, there was any number of other Circuit City that have all gone out of business. You've got the, uh, the in, you've, you, you, CDs came along. I mean, we st the first two records we did were on cassette and CD. Um, so there were still cassettes in the market at the time, 13 years ago. There was no, there was no iTunes. There was no Rhapsody. There was nothing like that. Uh, there was certainly no Facebook and no Twitter. So the tools available to musicians these days to be their own label and create their own publicity, generate their own ads, put their own posters, whether it be on a telephone pole or whether a poster be a poster on a Facebook uh, ad. Those, those things are so easy now for an artist to do. It, but the other side of being easy to do is that there's a whole lot more of it. When I started it, this business, there were probably 25,000 records made in a year. Now there's probably a million. So you have to do even more. There may be, it may be easier, but you got to do even more to get yourself to the top of that radio guy's pile of CDs that he gets every month. Or you got to do more to get yourself on the top of the desk at Gambit so you can get a review. I mean, I, I know you haven't, this isn't a research, you haven't done a thesis on this, but uh, I find it to be an interesting discussion. Would you, so you would say the difference between a culinary artist and the musician, let's say, the, of the growth period is that not enough musicians are proprietors of their own industry? Or they're not in the driving seat of the, of the business? I think that that's where the success in the culinary, in the culinary arts has come from. I think that, the, they ha that there have been some chefs that have taken it upon themselves to create a business team to grow. Um, and there, but I, I also think that there are examples of musicians that have done that. We have a thousand restaurants in New Orleans. I mean, how many of those chefs are doing that? And we are there, uh, are, are you know, who have taken it to that other, to that next level besides simply being a chef in a restaurant? I don't know that answer. 
Is it a dozen? Is it 20? Whether it's, you know, is it in the, if it's in that ballpark, then we're talking about 20 out of, out of 1,000 restaurants. We're talking about 20, 20 individuals who have taken it to a, another level, who have opened a second or a third or a fourth restaurant, who have, you know, something like that. So as a percentage, maybe the, in musicians in New Orleans, I mean, I can certainly tell you that people like uh, Irvin and Terrence Blanchard and, and uh, Harry, Harry Connick Jr. and Wynton Marcellus and Branford Marcellus and have taken it to much higher levels. Um, and I could go on from there, Alan Toussaint and Irma Thomas and, you know, there's people who have teams and um, so I don't know that we're lagging far behind, honestly, from, a, from cul culinary arts. But, it, and then you take the, from a uh, label standpoint, they don't have a label per se, they're not on a label, but bands like Bonarama uh, have all of the elements that are part of the label. They tour all over the place. Uh, they have, they're doing all the things publicity-wise that a label does. Um, so I think it's a little more piecemeal, and you don't, you know, when an, when an artist, when a band expands like that, it's not necessarily to the, um, I think there is growth, put it that way. It's just, it's just more, um, more mom and popish. How is it possible we can have such a large tourism industry? People call it the third Fortune 500 company. Based out of this city, third largest industry in the state. Um, and when you look at some numbers, depending on how you put it together, could really be justified as the largest industry period in sheer volume of uh, economy in the state. But we have one significant, and by what I would call significant, the list of awards and a type of product that's being put out, one significant label in, in New Orleans. Uh, although you have a thousand restaurants, we're, we're graduating people from business school. <coughs> you don't know has a great business school. We're graduating people from the business school here. They're graduating folks from Tulane, from Loyola. How is that possible right now? Well, even looking at capital, you see people putting up money to start all kind of businesses yeah. and companies. Uh, Naked Pizza, for example, it's taken off, went to the next level. But we've got one, one record label, even though we have a major HBO series being done with music. New Orleans music is the backdrop to it. Uh, maybe you have an answer to it, maybe, maybe you don't. But this is the type of question. I get asked on a daily basis about, about our industry and what's the deal with it. Yeah, I don't know that I have an answer. I know, that, I know, that what, I know what we do. I also say this. I don't consider us like, I, I don't consider, I always think that we should sell 10 or 100 times more, pro, more, more CDs than we sell. So, and I look at companies like, when, when you talk about that we're the only ones, I'll put, give my, and they're not here in New Orleans anymore, but well, you can't. Ca cash money and no <laughs> limit. Those were some examples of Louisiana-based companies that did, in the record business, that did something quite amazing. I mean, I can't imagine personally selling a million of any of our records. It would be a wonderful thing. They're all worthy of selling a million copies. But those guys did that, not just one time. Um, so, you know, I... But yeah, we and, and we're, I'm also not the we weren't the first record label in the city. There's been there's there's a decent number of labels that have got four, five, six artists under them that have been around for 25 and 30 years, um, that did a good job for a little while. But again, it's it's I think a lot of it is the wear and tear and the financing and dealing with hurdles. And you have to have you have to be a certain you have to have to certain things have to align to really stick it out for the long term. Um, the, the investment, by the way, of our that we, our company made to do some of these records, to travel into m multiple countries, they were, all, they were all significant investments that, that was where we always looked at them as a long-term payoff. So you also have to go into it with the idea that you may not make money right away on this. So that takes a certain person to do that. So I, I, 
think it's, you know, right now we have a city with 300,000 people, 320,000 people in it. We're, we are doing a much better job, I think, in educating people in the music industry. Uh, there was a good effort of several years back before Katrina of educating the banking industry about the music industry. Uh, trying to explain to, I know that the people at Hibernia at the time were very interested in trying to understand all the cash flows that come from a, from a uh, business. I'll say this too, that you know, it's, it's important if you're going to try as an artist to get a loan, to get credit. It's important to be able to show previous year's income statements and previous year's tax returns. And unfortunately, a lot of artists don't necessarily have the uh, significant tax returns for previous years. It's a very, a lot of it's, to be honest with you, you know, a lot of it's very much cash business. So there's a negative side to not necessarily reporting it all because you can't go to the bank and say, look at all of this money that we made. So it's a harder thing to finance, a harder thing for a bank to make a decision. Yeah, this is, this person is worthy of a loan so that they can buy a 15 passenger van and take their band out on the road, or this is this band is worthy of a loan so they can buy a uh, buy a rent a tour bus. But if if musicians were, you know, aware of all those things and keeping an eye on their credit, and so those those are all things that require some, you know, more and more of educating uh, them, educating all people, all kids should be educated in those kinds of things from early on. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult when you get out of college and you can't find, a, you know, you can't get a credit card or something like that. I want to open it up to uh, the class and start asking some questions. But before we do, I do something called a uh, word association and a pros questionnaire. So you're kind of familiar with how yeah. to do this, right? Yeah. So you ready for it? Uh-huh. All right. Cash money records. Um. The, the, the name that I was going to give to my first to the company at the beginning was no, no money records. A little combination of cash money and no limit. <laughs> Governor Bobby Jindal. Um, intelligent. The New Orleans City Council, current. Um, f functioning well. Uh, Mayor C. Ray Nagin. No comment. Mayor Mitch Landrieu? Uh, possible President of the United States. Tulane University? Um, uh, excellent. Loyola University? Excellent. University of New Orleans? Excellent. Kermit Ruffins? Um, the most fun person on earth. Rebirth Brass Band? The biggest party on earth. Jeremy Davenport. Uh, cool. Kim Kardashian. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, unbelievable. <laughs> Reggie Bush. Uh, spectacular. What is your favorite word? Excellent. What is your least favorite word? I don't know. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh, music. What turns you off? Uh, religious fundamentalists. What is your favorite curse word? Douchebag. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Uh, my baby, talk, gibbering. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, a car crash. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I'm doing just what I want to do. What profession would you like not to do? Um, I don't know. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Dude. <laughs> so let's open it up for Mark Samuels. Yes, ma'am. 
I heard a quote before that was, um, in New Orleans, music is a necessity, so it's paid for like a necessity. In other places, it's a luxury, so it's paid for like a luxury. And I think New Orleans history has hindered its uh, export of music because people will go to Los Angeles or Nashville or New York to try and be discovered by a record label. Nobody will come to New Orleans, or very few people will. And I think just our history of they're going to make good music so we can go there to hear the music, but, you know, you can hear it there whenever is its biggest hindrance. You know, certainly Nashville, Los Angeles, <coughs> New York have music, more of a music industry. I mean, you know, Nashville, you've got a good concentration of songwriters, and, and in Los Angeles and New York, you have a large number of labels that are concentrated in an area, and you've got, therefore, you've got the music attorneys and the business. But we have those, we have those ingredients here. Um, but I don't know that we are really lagging that far behind them. Um, again, like I, th I think that a lot of the, the industry has become more f fragmented in that a artist can do so many of the activities that they need to do. And even from the standpoint of the, with communication, just email and so forth, if you need a, I mean, if you need a certain legal document, you can, f you can either have an attorney in another city that's doing that stuff for you, or it can be someone here in New Orleans, or you know, where somebody in New York could be calling somebody here. I, I just think that, as, if we continue to educate, we continue to have programs that are educating people, like the arts program here at UNO and the, the arts administration program, where we've had interns and, um, and the and the programs that will leave nameless at other universities. That if we continue to educate people, people will find. Our young people will find opportunities that are missing in the city. One of them being the publishing industry. Um, but even that, there's a company called Audio Socket is one example. Audio Socket had a, had a, is a New Orleanian involved, lived in Seattle, moving his company down here to New Orleans, making licensing of music kind of easy to do online, where it's all it's all cleared in advance. So there are ideas like that, and things are starting to happen here that way. And it just takes a, you know, just takes a few of those things coming. And even, even from the publishing standpoint, all the film business here, and I, I look at my staff every day and I say, like, we got to get to these films and find these music supervisors for these films as they're coming to New Orleans. I mean, not everyone is going to be suited for a New Orleans music style like we have, but some of them that are coming here it's going to fit somewhere, and maybe it'll just fit in, the, in a bar scene or something. So those kind of opportunities are definitely exist here for someone to grow a business around. Next question. Um, how would you compare what you do um, to say Cosimo, Cosimo Matassa's recording studio? And I know his personality really drove that business, but why do you think there was why do you think that ended it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, Cosmo was driven more by, like, I know nothing about a soundboard. I could not do anything on a, I don't know what the dials do. I mean, I sort of do. But I could not go into a recording studio, and I could not hook up a microphone and, make, and record anything. I don't know how to do that. So my, my drive was from a business, marketing, distribution, uh, as an MBA in finance, that's, that was my drive. And then the fact that I loved jazz primarily, that I had great connections like through Winton, and Winton introduced me to Wes Anderson, and then when I was in uh, a college a music program at one summer at Loyola, I was in a band with Victor Goins, and then producing these concerts. So my interest was a, is a, as a music fan who was looking for something to do using my business background. And Cosmos was more from a producer standpoint, recording standpoint. And that's, there's a lot of record labels that are where the, it's somebody who just loves to be in a studio and loves to record. 
I actually, after the first few records, which were, was kind of a novelty for me to be at the studio, I don't go. I don't like the process. It's true. Yes, ma'am. So coming from a more business background, like there's a lot of musicians here that don't make a lot of money. It is kind of hard to make money here. Um, personally, I get health insurance at the New Orleans Musicians Clinic, and they have suffered and endured some really terrible budget cuts lately, a lot of services that have been discontinued. So, I mean, how do you feel about something like this? Because like, it's one of the only ways that we're able to afford certain health care. And then are, are you involved in any way in like maybe the one people are labels that are making money in the city helping things like the Musicians Clinic to continue on? Well, on the subject of health care, I was just having a sub, uh, conversation with a friend over lunch. Um, I have health insurance, and it, I, it's a $5,000 deductible. So if I have some catastrophe in my family, we're going to be covered, but I don't have any health insurance either to speak of, you know, that allows me to just go see a doctor. But I value an annual physical and making sure that I'm around to take care of my children more than I value uh, 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 expensive meal the next, that ne you know, next weekend. So I make sure that, I, that what part of my budget is set aside so that I can afford $300 to go see my doctor once a year. And you know, if something major comes up, fortunately, I do have the wherewithal to have insurance. So I think that people need to prioritize What's imp if that's important to somebody to go see a doctor, to go see a regular checkup, they need to prioritize that. They need to put that money aside. And that's something across the board, not just musicians. Okay? And too often, people don't, make the pri they don't prioritize those things that are really most important or, because that can be, you can let that go. You can let your teeth, you can go year after year after year and never spend the $85 to go get your teeth cleaned. And you can choose to go out and buy a cup of coffee every morning. And I don't know if any of y'all know, what if you were to not, if you spend $4 a day every day on a cup of coffee, at, uh, do you know after 20 years what that would be worth if you earn 10% interest a year, 10% interest on your money if you put it aside? Anybody have a clue? Just shout out a number. Time's Shout out a number. 20 years? 20 years. $4 a day. Earning 10% interest 10%. on your money. Probably be about 50 grand. It's about a million. A million. Okay. So, so that's, that's part of my answer. The, uh, the other side is that the musician's clinic is a very worthwhile, it's, it's very worthwhile. Clinics are very worthwhile. And, and health care and preventive health care is very worthwhile. And... Um, for those of, those of us who can help other people, we, yes, the answer is yes, we should try to, to help other people. I help other people in other ways too. Uh, from the company, we, we're extremely supportive of the Louis Armstrong Summer Jazz Camp, which educates 100 kids every summer for three weeks. Um, and and uh, I have an, a nephew with Down syndrome, so I'm a, a, interested in helping those causes. So, um, but there aren't a lot of record labels out there that can support the uh, musician's clinic. If we were asked, one of our artists was asked, or if we were asked to do something that could uh, draw attention to it, we would. And usually when I see something for the musician's clinic that's out there, a benefit, I'll make sure I help promote it. Next question. <coughs> Anybody? Do you always think that me obtaining music in other ways is, is it always bad? I mean, what about exposure to like new artists? Like, uh, I know for myself, I don't listen to your channel stuff at all. Like, any music I listen to is like independent music. Their labels are never are moderately big at most, you know. Is it always a negative? I mean, I see some positive to it. Well, I guess. I, I'll turn this around. I've never, I've never eaten a $100,000 bar. You know the candy bar? I never ate one of those before. But if I stole one off of a can uh, out of a store and tasted it, and I decided I really liked it a lot, 
and then I bought, and then I decided that was all I was going to buy from now on, it would still be illegal. I could do it. I mean, I could go out today and steal a $100,000 bar from a convenience store. That's an easy thing to do. But I, but I was told not to do it. It's illegal, and I didn't do it. So the argument that you might discover some music as a result of stealing music isn't a good one. The idea of discovering music by having your friends turn you on, going to I Like, uh, typing into Google the name of a song and being able to listen to it for free, all the stuff that's available out there that's legit, go at it, all of that you can. But don't burn a CD for a friend. And, and you know, unless, but look, if you contacted me and said, look, I cannot afford, I really love, I heard the Kermit Ruffins track on the radio the other day. I can't afford it. I'm a struggling student. I love that song. I'd love, for a co I'd love a copy. I'd probably email you a copy. Be totally legit. You, you know, I own it. It's yours. But, it, but unless I put it out there and make it specifically available for people to take, then no, it's, it's uh, stealing. I just know that at least some artists that I've talked to, like I've gone to like local shows and stuff, some of them are happy that other people will listen to their music for free and then they'll expose them to larger audiences. They'll get more people to come out to their shows. You know, the, like, I'm not saying I do this all the time. When I find the band that I like, I absolutely want to support them. There's advantages. I absolutely want to support them if I find them and I enjoy them. You know? No doubt there's advantages. <laughs> the same advantages that I just described with the $100,000 bar. I could steal it once and then decide that's my favorite candy bar and I buy a bag of them. But that's not my decision to make. It's the artist's decision. But yeah, you might, there's been plenty of people. There, there's plenty of people who, who discover music and end up buying a lot of it. That's all, that's, that's great. That's, that is an advantage to it. It's just not legit. Next question. Go on once. Go on twice. Yes. Are you a musician too? I played saxophone very poorly <laughs> in high school and I was in a band called The Urinals in college. The Urinals? The Urinals. It was a kind of an avant-garde, uh, no. We were a uh, uh, party band in college. Uh, but I played very poorly, and I haven't played in a long time. Um, but I do appreciate the effort. I appreciate the fact that if I was to try to pick up a saxophone today and play it, I could only do it for about a minute and a half before my embouchure would be gone. So I, I, I have a lot of appreciation for how the effort that a musician, a professional musician, uh, what they have to do to hone their craft. Um, I would find have some questions. I would find it extremely uh, satisfying to see you play the saxophone. Uh, one of the things I would say is that Mark is much better at Twitter and Facebook than I am, <laughs> and I can admit that. And that, you know, on our class, uh, as they blog, you're welcome. We'll create an address for you, uh, and you're welcome to come in and blog along with them. And we also put an incentive uh, for the folks that have the best Facebook and Twitter through the end of the semester about course discussion uh, gets an automatic A. So you're also welcome to join in with Twitter and Facebook uh, with us uh, on that. Okay. Um, two things I would like to offer for whoever gives the best blog today, I think we should give them a Kermit Ruffin CD. Um, we should give them a complimentary. Nope. The label does have complimentary CDs. Promo, uh, promo <laughs> a, promo, a promotional copy, copy for the CD, so I think we can do that. Uh, and I think for anyone who's really interested uh, in some more stuff that Mark's doing. Mark's got a whole operation of stuff going on. If you'd like to get a little bit more behind the scenes, uh, maybe there's also an opportunity for you guys maybe to show up, even though he doesn't like to go to the studio, to show up to the studio to maybe experience what the Rebirth is doing. Um, and I'm excited about that, that signing. Interestingly enough, I tried to sign the Rebirth to my regular label and they, they went with Mark's label. <laughs> Instead, the other thing is Mark and I are working on a special project uh, together, a, actually a book and a CD that will come together and 
will be available before the end of this course. And so each of you will receive one of that and there will be some project in this course that will be associated with it. So I'm, I'm really excited about that and you'll you hear a lot more about that as class goes along. Um, Anything else you want to? No, I'll, I will. I'll, if you're interest, interested in the economics of a CD, um, if you go to our blog, which you can get to from the, there's a link at the bottom of BasinStreetRecords.com that'll take you to our blog, um, and then search for label economics. I've clearly spelled out what a typical record looks like on our label from both the physical side and the digital side the royalties, accounting, and everything else. It's a, if you have any interest, in, it's, it's, I'm very open and honest about all of the costs and so forth there. Just go, like I said, label economics on our blog. Um, and you might find other interesting things there. Um, I've tried to keep it pretty up to date since uh, over the last five or six years. Um, I invite you to all come out November 5th to Kermit Ruffins at Rock and Bowl to the CD release party. It'll be Kermit Ruffins with a a uh, horn, big horn section, and um, records, records, are you just CDs? We uh, actually sh should say that I have a uh, I have a Los Hombres Calientes LP in my car that's on its way to Finland, uh, but we only did two uh, LPs. I have an idea on this next uh, with with records in the future that we will sell vinyl when we have sold X number of copies of it. Like, if we get enough interest specifically in, one, in a project, then we will press vinyl afterwards, after the records come out. I want to maybe try to do that here and there. But um, only two times. And we did it, we, in, the, in both cases, we did a Los Hombres Calientes project and a uh, uh, Kermit Ruffins, and they were like, a year after the records had come out to help continue to promote those good records. Uh, but they don't, they don't have as much music on them as the CD. Any other questions for Mark? Well, let's thank our guest, Mark Samuels. Did you have one? Yeah. I'm going to check out that uh, Lee Barconomics thing, but say when we go to buy um, a song, iTunes or Amazon for, I think, you know, 99 cents, that's the most common price. What percentage of that actually goes to the label and to the artist? Uh, I don't Mark is over there. F, okay, here's the, number, here's the breakdown real quick. Um, 99 cents is what you pay. Um, our dis we have a company called IOTA, which uh, IOTA is an independent online distribution alliance. Irvin's label uses them as well, so I believe, right? Right. They, uh, they will collect from Apple 70 cents. IOTA sends along to us 70 less 15%, so somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 cents goes to us. And of the 60 cents that we receive, um, that would be BSR, we pay about um, 9 cents of that to the songwriters, to the songwriter. Um, so, so we end up with 51, about 51 cents for a song after, we've, after that. And I'm, I guess that's all the costs that we're... So Apple's really taking a pretty big chunk of that. Apple's got a good chunk of it. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and, you know, and right now we have probably our uh, IOTA services streams and downloads. Um, Apple is probably 80% of the money that we receive from IOTA. The nice thing about IOTA, and that's, they actually take a big chunk too, taking 15% of everything that comes in. Um, IOTA, um, all they do is they consolidate. They, they, they are, uh, they'll put it out there to say 200 platforms, everything from Verizon and Apple to um, uh, Sprint. So to, yeah. So yeah, and th so they create. The, we, we send them along these files, and then they get it distributed to all the various platforms. But they also bring in all the money, 
And if you can imagine, if I was to try to account for the 72 cents that we received from Rap City or from Napster or something like that for a particular, in a particular month, if I was to try to account for that 72 cents that we get that month and, and distribute it to all the, the artists that received a penny or three pennies, that accounting nightmare would be well, would be, would t cost a lot more than 70 cents to account for. So IOTA gives us a nice, easy to read statement that accumulates all of the monies received, takes us about 15 minutes to account for a whole month's worth of digital sales from all over the world. So to me, it's been worth it. But at the point where it's, it's one thing when you're selling thousands of dollars and they're making hundreds, but at the point where you're selling hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and they're taking hundreds of thousands of dollars for that, it may not be the, they're, either their price needs to come down or the, it may not be the best model. The other company that's out there that's doing a lot of this, the lion's share of, uh, of digital aggregation is called TuneCore. Um, and they actually work on a different model. They work on, you pay them a flat fee to put your music on, to put a track up on, the, on their system. They put it on 20 platforms, including Apple, including iTunes, but only 20 platforms. You put it, pay a flat fee, but they send you all the money they receive. So that's where that works out. And I'll just, I'll complete that. This works out, this 51 cents for a song or about $5 for an album um, on the digital, digital side ends up being kind of in the same ballpark on the physical side if a record costs uh, 1590, $15.98 at the store, say at Borders, is what you pay for it, and our distributor gets, our distributor receives it, gets receives ten dollars and thirty cents. Our physical distributor. Of the ten dollars and thirty cents, they send us about uh, more like seven dollars and seventy-five cents but then they also have all these fees they take out. And then there's also things like uh, um, to, to, have it on a to have it across the country on Porter's stores um, will cost us like $3,000 a month to make sure that it's at eye level so you can see it. So there's fees like that that we have to pay for to place this product. But of the $7.75 we receive, we pay about a dollar to songwriters so we're at six seventy-five, and uh, and we and of that six seventy-five, we also have to manufacture the CD, as opposed to over here where we're not manufacturing anything. So that costs us about a dollar. So we're at about five seventy-five. Is our if I did my math. So five seventy-five versus that, and this one, by the way, when once when we have a physical CD, it sits in our. Warehouse, that's, there's a cost to that. It sits in our distributor's warehouse. They charge us for that. It sits in a store. There's a cost for that. So um, this method of dis digital distribution obviously is the um, most sensible for a, digital, for a digital product. You could argue that analog recordings and LPs and all of that is a much more gratifying sound or or whatnot, but uh, when you're, now that we are recording digitally, it makes the most sense to distribute digitally. I've given in. Um, I'd like there to be, you know, as bandwidth increases, the quality of those digital um, songs will be better. But I think to also uh, add to your question, the distributor distribution it doesn't matter if it's music or whatever it is. Distribution is always the hub of where most things are controlled because that's where people are going to receive it. So be it alcohol or food or cars, wherever the product is that people go to receive it is always uh, going to be a large percentage of control, uh, and rightfully so, even if you are the content. So content is important, but you, the greatest content that can't get to, get to the people who desire the, uh, the content to experience it doesn't really make that much of a difference. And that's always the rub, and as a matter of fact, um, in America, we've grown several industries uh, and grown several jobs through just creating distribution aspects of, of businesses. So that's always a uh, it's always a point people look at. Um, that 
I think when you look at a lot of investment masters like Warren Buffett and folks like that, that they've always taken a uh, good position on knowing kind of what the distribution aspect of whatever the business is, be it financial models or actual hard product things. But in the music industry uh, and also in the uh, liter literary industry, that's where a lot of the stuff is changing. And although they may be receiving that percentage now, tomorrow somebody can come up with a device that completely kills them, which is what happened with all the record stores. So you, they enjoyed their percentage for however long they enjoyed it for. And then tomorrow somebody created the iPod and their entire were closed. And so that's the, that's the downside of the, yeah. the business. And yet, tow, you know, tower, the, all the, the it's, it's been an interesting 13 years because there was, there were so many things like the, the i, the, um, the iPod, but there was, and being able to burn a CD easily. But there was also Walmart and Target and Circuit City Best and Buy. Best Buy, who also have had their, who have also done, each done their part in destroying the music retail business. Walmart, for example, which uses music as a loss leader. When you talk about not valuing music, Walmart, you, they'll, yeah, they'll pick up our product, but they'll make us, they'll make our distributor, rather than their distributor getting $10.30, our distributor has to agree on about $9. And they have to agree on ridiculous terms, like ridiculous return allowances and so forth. And then Walmart uses, actually sells it as a loss. So they might pay $9.30 or something for, the, for it and sell it for $9 or $8.99 and actually lose money on it. So, and they, they don't necessarily do that with, say, one of our titles, but they're doing it with the big title, the... the, the Sugarland record that comes out that everybody's going to run to Walmart and pick up. They'll use it. They'll lose their thirty cents there so that they can sell you a washing Perfect. machine or a or a some some groceries. Um, so they've done their share of destroying the music retail. So I'll leave you guys with that. Same time, same place next week. Let's thank Mark Sammons once again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 